the conduction of action potentials to the axon terminals will lead to the release of neurochemical signals called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are important because action potentials cannot pass across the synaptic cleft to stimulate the next neuron, muscle, or gland. You could think of neurotransmitters as pieces of mail being transferred via the postal service, going from a sender, or presynaptic neuron, to a recipient, or postsynaptic neuron, muscle, or gland. We are going to focus on a presynaptic neuron meeting with a postsynaptic neuron. The first step that occurs upon action potentials arriving to the axon terminals of a neuron is the rapid depolarization of the area. The depolarization causes voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated calcium channels to open. As sodium and calcium ions flow down their electrochemical gradient into the neuron, this triggers the vesicles containing thousands of a particular neurotransmitter to approach the presynaptic membrane of the axon terminals. The increased calcium concentration in the presynaptic axon terminals also plays an important role in the exocytosis of the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, something I will show you in a few minutes. What we will focus on first is the formation of the docking complex. The docking complex is characterized as being the neurotransmitter vesicle bound to the presynaptic membrane of the axon terminal. The formation of this docking complex will end with neurotransmitter release into the synaptic cleft. The formation of the docking complex involves four key proteins. On the presynaptic membrane, there are two T-snare proteins, syntaxin and SNAP25. To better think of these T-snare proteins, think of T as standing for target. This makes sense because these presynaptic membrane snare proteins are the target for vesicle binding. Snares make sense because snares are traps consisting of a wire or rope noose for catching animals. Therefore, this makes sense because these snare proteins catch the vesicle. On the vesicle membrane, there is one V snare, synaptobrevin, and also a calcium binding protein called synaptotagmin. To better think of these proteins, V stands for vesicular makes sense because the snare protein is on the vesicle membrane. Synaptotagmin is a calcium sensor that gets tagged with calcium. Now remember that depolarization of the axon terminals has resulted in the significant rush of sodium and calcium ions into the neuron. This causes neurotransmitter vesicles to approach the presynaptic membrane of the axon terminals. Synaptobrevin on the vesicle membrane will interact with syntaxin and SNAP25 on the presynaptic membrane. This forms the docking complex. Synaptotagmin then becomes bound or tagged with calcium, thus initiating fusion of the vesicle membrane with the presynaptic membrane of the axon terminal. Fusion of the vesicle and the presynaptic membranes can occur because like all cell membranes in the body, these membranes are composed of phospholipids. The result of membrane fusion is the exocytosis of thousands of neurotransmitters released from the vesicle into the synaptic cleft. You can think of this whole process as a boat with passengers coming to dock at a port. The boat approaches the dock becomes bound to the dock after ropes have been tied around docking posts, and then a ramp is lowered, thus allowing passengers to be released onto the land. The other way to view the formation of the docking complex and release of neurotransmitters is by using the term kiss and run. This type of membrane fusion, termed kiss and run fusion, occurs when a vesicle docks, opens temporarily, releases its contents, and then closes and moves away from that membrane. The vesicle can then be reused after this. 
So the term kiss and run applies here because it is like kissing someone. At first, it is a light kiss, forming that docking complex. And then it becomes a more intense kiss with open mouths. This is vesicle and presynaptic membrane fusion. At the, intense, at the end of the intense kissing, the two people pull apart. And this is the vesicle separating from the presynaptic membrane and moving away. Once released into the synaptic cleft, the neurotransmitters diffuse across the cleft and bind to specific ligand-gated receptors on the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. Upon neurotransmitter binding, ion channels will open and specific ions will flow into the neuron down their electrochemical gradient into the postsynaptic neuron. This rush of ions into the postsynaptic neuron will change the electrical charge inside, thus causing a type of graded potential called a postsynaptic potential. This change in electrical charge may be increasingly positive when the opening of sodium channels and sodium moving in. This results in depolarization, which is excitatory. This occurs when excitatory neurotransmitters bind to their receptors. The change in electrical charge can be increasingly negative as well, and this is going to involve the opening of potassium channels and potassium moving out, or the opening of chloride channels and chloride moving in, chloride being negative in charge. Regardless of whether it's potassium moving out or chloride moving in to the postsynaptic neuron, this will result in hyperpolarization, which is going to be inhibitory. This is going to occur when inhibitory neurotransmitters bind to their receptors. If hyperpolarization occurs, then the postsynaptic neuron is inhibited and any type of response is stopped. If depolarization occurs and threshold is reached, then an action potential will be initiated by the postsynaptic neuron. And in this way, the electrical signal from the presynaptic neuron has been transferred to the postsynaptic neuron via the excitatory neurotransmitter. Action potential conduction will then occur down the axon much as it did in the presynaptic neuron. So what happens to excess neurotransmitters that do not bind to receptors? Once action potentials cease to be generated by the presynaptic neuron, neurotransmitters are no longer released and any of these excess neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft need to be removed. Removal of excess neurotransmitters is very important to ensure that neurotransmitter effects are not abnormally prolonged or abnormally intense. For example, excesses in neurotransmitters can cause various mental disorders such as schizophrenia, depression, and ADD. Excesses in neurotransmitters can also cause muscle spasms, seizures, migraines, and prolonged erections, among many other things. Excess neurotransmitters are generally removed from the synaptic cleft in one of two main ways. First, enzymatic degradation of neurotransmitters can occur. This will involve the breakdown of neurotransmitters into non-active products, which are then reabsorbed by the presynaptic neuron to be resynthesized into neurotransmitters or just reabsorbed into the surrounding blood capillaries to be used elsewhere. The second main way for removal of excess neurotransmitters is to recycle the neurotransmitters themselves. This involves excess neurotransmitters binding to special receptors on the outside of the presynaptic membrane and then being brought in via receptor-mediated endocytosis. Once back inside the presynaptic neuron, these neurotransmitters are packaged back up into vesicles for later use. So this is it. This is how neurotransmitters are released from an excited presynaptic neuron to go and spread the signal onwards to another neuron, a postsynaptic neuron. A similar process will occur where neurons meet muscles and where neurons meet, meet glands.